Good evening, boa tarde. Eu vi te falar que tem alguns brasileiros, mas eu não sei de onde. Uh, I, <laughs> um, I would like to welcome you um, tonight. And I wanted to remind you, um, last year we made a conference and we published this book. And after this conference, we will also give out a call and it will be again double blind peer reviewed, but we will publish a book about the best papers of this conference. So please remind or keep in mind that we will do that and please try to be part of it. Now I would like to warmly welcome our president, the president of the United, uh, United, <laughs> United Applied Arts, um, yes. <laughs> this is how, how politics go. Um, uh, yes, um, uh, Rector Dr. Gerald Bast, the stage is yours. Thank you, Ruth. This uh, was not that wrong, maybe, uh, calling me president of the United <laughs> Arts and Sciences, because this is one of my attitudes and one of my great wishes to bring arts, science, technology, humanities much more together than we have it now out of these uh, little uh, disciplinary boxes. But anyway, uh, art and design education in times of change, you couldn't have uh, chosen a better and uh, a more important title for your conference, uh, which uh, the University of uh, Applied Arts under the umbrella of INSEA uh, invited you. Uh, we all know uh, how often the term change uh, is used by politicians, uh, by journalists, by scientists, also by artists. Uh, and sometimes we, we forget what is behind this term of change. That the reason why we are talking about change is that we all realize, and some societies much more than we do here in Austria or in Europe or in the so-called Western world, much more realize and suffer from the changes, from a world, from societies which are characterized by uncertainty, uh, by ambiguity, uh, by the feeling of uh, hopeless. And who better than the artists could try to meet these so-called grand challenges, which only can met with a collaboration between arts and sciences? Who would better have an opportunity to answer a situation where ambiguity, uncertainty, and things like that are in the middle of the topic. Art and design, all these people who are working in these fields, they are used to work and to handle uncertainty. They are used to work with ambiguity. They even produce ambiguity. And I'm deeply convinced that these challenges who are characterized by those things cannot be met by answers uh, given under the approach of yes or no, A or B, right or wrong. We need non-linear thinking. We need multi-layered, multi-sensory thinking, working and acting. And you, people, from the art education, people from artistic uh, theory and praxis. You have the opportunity and you, we all have the responsibility to step into this field. Not just looking at existing art mar markets, not just looking at so-called beauties, the real beauty is meeting the challenges we have with 
the matters and the meanings we have. Aesthetics and also breaking existing aesthetics. So I want to stop now. You have two more of your uh, wonderful uh, keynotes in a very inspiring and dense program. Uh, I'm really happy that uh, you came to Vienna. Uh, you took the invitation. Uh, I also want to thank uh, Ruth Matthias Baird and her team who organized all these. Uh, it's really a fantastic uh, program uh, these uh, two or three days. And I hope you will not only enjoy mm -hmm. these days, but also take something home to your work at home and give it there to your students uh, and to your colleagues who cannot be here today. So enjoy the two keynotes and then enjoy uh, and uh, accept my invitation to a small reception here in this uh, not by chance uh, called uh, Innovation Laboratory, which in fact is uh, a laboratory not dealing uh, with chemistry, uh, but rather dealing with the chemistry of the brain. Thank you. Yes, now we would like to ask uh, um, our keynote and our vice president, uh, Barbara, uh, sorry, the, the, uh, the, the, I mixed up. <laughs> sorry, Lu first Luisa and then our vice president. Yeah. Hello. So we've got a little technical arrangement. I'm really happy to present the next keynote speaker. Um, she is the director of the Research Center for Museums and Galleries of the School of Museum Studies of the University of Leicester in UK. Um, with the research undertaken there, short, it's called RCMG, they try to stimulate critical and creative museum thinking and practice, as well as to support museums to become more dynamic and socially purposeful sites, or we could even say more relevant to society. In her numerous research projects she's directing within this scope, her most recent one is with a really beautiful title. It's called Exceptional and Extraordinary Unruly Bodies and Minds in the Medical Museum. In her talk today, she will focus on the potential of the participation in arts and culture to become reflective, empathetic, resilient and engaged citizens. So this is a quote from her and I think this is really beautiful. So central and central to this goal is according to her that we value difference by making it part of our strengths and diversity. So I'm very much looking forward to her talk and to get more, more about this concept and thoughts and happy to have her here. Please welcome Jocelyn Dodd. Well, thanks very much for that introduction and I'm absolutely delighted to be with you. Yeah. I think it's okay. Is, can everybody hear? No. <laughs> Can everybody hear you? Can everybody hear? Yes. Thank you. Okay, I'm absolutely delighted to be here, and to, it, it's my first time in, in Vienna, so it's an absolute delight. But I'm really delighted to be part of this conference because I think the theme of it is something which is very dear to me. Um, I think there's so much about the world that is changing. There's such inequality and there's so many challenges that I think we need as, as many people to be engaged in creating a better and fairer world. And it feels, um, as, as we hear more in the, the news every day, that those challenges become greater and greater. So I hope that we can go on something of a journey of the ways in which we can address contemporary social issues through culture and think of it in some way as a framework for action. I think that arts and culture have never been more important and they're often, certainly in a UK context, under more pressure than ever before with redu reductions in budgets from public spending and so on. But I think it's hugely important 
that we maintain our commitment and engagement in those areas. We need to have people who are ever more reflective, who are empathetic, who are resilient and engaged citizens. And participation in arts and cultures enables us to develop these skills that are so critical in a world undergoing such drastic change. This session is going to draw on research by the Research Centre for Museums and Galleries at Leicester University. And it'll consider what elements are required to address contemporary social issues, what values underpin this work, and how do these pervade every element of the work that we do? How can we develop activist practice? What ethical issues do we need to consider? How do we work collaboratively? What range of skills, expertise, and approaches do we need to use? How do we ensure that some people's views are not privileged over others? How do we ensure that they're of contemporary relevance? What's the impact of the work? How do we capture the impact on participants? Why is this important? Why is it critical to collect that material? Central to this session is the, is the, the view that uh, we have to value difference. By making it part of our strength, of our diversity, it becomes critical to our ability to thrive combining a mixture of processes and case studies. I want to look at a range of different issues which I hope will give some ideas of ways in which we can move forward so we can be more adaptable to diverse contexts uh, where we can provide rigorous underpinning of support for cultural work that's concerned with, cult with, with cultural issues. The areas that I want to cover essentially cover these five areas. So let's begin by thinking about the value of arts and culture. I'll just say a little bit first of all about the Research Centre because it's um, quite specific um, and we're very focused around informing and enriching creative museum thinking, policy and practice. And we want to support museums to become more dynamic and socially purposeful institutions. So the work we do is very outward looking, it's very collaborative. We not only collaborate with museums, but we collaborate always with other partners who are socially focused. Um, and we, we, we set up in 1991, uh, 1999, sorry, um, and since then have developed a whole range of different projects, many of them interrelated, but very focused around learning and the social role of museums. We have our own independent research agenda, but we also do do commissioned work, research and evaluation as well. All our work is externally funded and it's all team-based as well. Okay, so let's begin by thinking about the value of arts and culture. There's recently a report um, which was produced by the Arts and Humanities Research Council in the UK. I think this is a fascinating report and I'd really recommend it. Understanding the value of arts and culture um, by Geoffrey Kosick, really interesting report, really interesting project as well. Uh, which was in itself a, a collaborative process. So the significance of arts and culture, I think, is hugely important. And sometimes we underestimate that. We underestimate its significance in addressing social issues, contemporary issues. This study um, brought together over 70 pieces of work, including new research, critical reviews of the literature, and specialist workshops. It included a piece of research that the Research Centre did on museums and galleries. And the project represents the most extensive and wide-ranging attempt to try to understand the difference that engaging with arts and culture makes, both to individuals, society, and the economy. The research looked at culture and the arts in the absolute wider sense. And I think this, in its, for me, is hugely important because it locates arts and culture in a different way. One of the main aims of the project was to cut through the polarization of issues that had caused a logjam in thinking about the value of culture. 
um, and how it might be captured. So they were really insistent in, 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 in moving away from the frustrations of the binaries and extended debates about between intrinsic and extrinsic, about instrumental, the cultural... Uh, <coughs> sorry. Um, some of the binaries that have existed. So the value of culture, elitist versus popular, qualitative work versus quantitative, public funded versus commercial, private versus public consumption, and amateur versus professional. The aim of the project was to forget those and to think afresh with a view that culture is part of what we all do much of the time. Often the consumption of culture take place, takes place in the home, it can be done by amateurs. It's as much about a young group of teenagers playing in a band as it is about people visiting art galleries. So it's about trying to get away from this division that exists, and which is often framed by funders, and people like the Arts Council, certainly in the UK, tend to have a huge impact on what we think culture is. Um, so the report, I think, comes up with some really interesting findings, which are, uh, none of them will be news to you, they're things that you know, but it's good to have them validated by robust research. The study paid particular attention to the ability of the arts and culture to help shape reflective individuals who have a greater understanding of themselves and of their lives. And I think that sense of understanding yourself, and we know how much art and, and design can help people to do that. It also showed an increased empathy and respect for others. Again, fundamentally important in a changing world. How significant that is to be able to respect other people, to, it, to have a sense of empathy, to appreciate the diversity of human experiences and cultures. Hugely significant. Um, there's a hugely significant skill in a time of rapid change, especially in relation to a world where there are so many displaced people. The study also um, evidenced that participation in arts and culture produces more engaged citizens, uh, promoting civic behaviours such as voting and volunteering, providing alternative possibilities to current assumptions creating a broader political imagination, enabling greater reflection and debate of complex issues, for instance, climate change, and helping minorities to find a group and to express their identity. And again, these are so important in, uh, at a point of time when our democratic and political systems are so under strain. Interestingly, the report also talked about improving health and well-being as well. Uh, and often I think we underestimate the significance of health and well-being, but this is so critical to us uh, working effectively and being able to uh, reach our full potential as well. So this is having the ability to be resilient, to be, it helps us to cope with ever-changing challenges and especially when we're in a, 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 in a situation of instability, being more resilient, having better mental health is incredibly important. So having, uh, being able to see that as, as something that comes as a result of, of cultural and uh, uh, art engagement is really significant, really important. So participation in the arts and culture enables us to develop these skills. Um, and our understanding of this is really important. So understanding our value is massively important. We need to be clear about our value, both to create maximum opportunities in how we create it, but also to understand the impact of what we do and what responsibility that involves as well, because responsibility it is really significant in this. Which moves me on to my next area, which is values. I want to focus specifically on one museum service, and that's National Museums Liverpool. And here you can see their aspiration. They want to be the world's leading example of an inclusive museum service. Values are absolutely critical 
in the work of addressing contemporary social issues. In the publication, Museums for Social Justice, David Fleming, director of National Museums Liverpool, outlines various ways in which commitment to social justice within his organisation is expressed. This is through a series of statements and strategies including the organisational mission statement, but it's also about the staffing structure, it's about governance, it's about collecting, it's about public programming, it's about everything, it's the whole organisation. So the mission statement includes uh, a desire to be the world's leading example of, the inclusive, of, a, of an inclusive museum service, we're inclusive and de a democratic museum service. We aim to maximise social impact and educational benefit for all. Museums change lives, and they genuinely believe that. We believe that museums are places of ideas and dialogue. We use collections to inspire people and don't shy away from controversy. We believe in the power of museums to help uh, promote good and active citizenship to act as agents of social change. We believe in the concept of and campaign for social change. We believe in social justice. We believe in the importance of sustainable development and the role of conservation and protection of the built and the natural environment. We believe in seeking out new opportunities and, uh, and innovative ways of working to keep our public offer fresh, relevant and challenging. So values are part of their DNA. They're absolutely critical to what they're about. And articulating them in an honest way is also critical as well. Many museums hide behind a smokescreen of authority. The British Museum, for example, fudges its collecting of material from around the world uh, from colonial times, which is now produced in a sort of contemporary 21st century idea of the universal museum. Okay, so it doesn't get to grips with its history, it doesn't take any responsibility, nor does it ask any issues about what those collections mean in a 21st century context without really presenting the reality of those views in an explicit way the public often don't understand and so they don't engage with this whereas i think liverpool are honest about what they are it's obvious when you go to the museum it's inclusive it's noisy it's full it's busy they've quadrupled the number of visitors Instead of being a museum service, which like many, is about uh, responding to middle class needs, actually this represents the d demographic background of the city itself. They're activists, they take a stance, they actively want social change, they want to be democratic, they want to support people to become good citizens. They're a place of ideas, a place of dialogue, they're not afraid of being controversial and they actively campaign on a number, in a number of areas. Liverpool is a predominantly um, poor city with a not very educated population. But as I say, they've managed to quadruple the visitors. Um, so they deal with issues which are relevant to the people of Liverpool. They deal with issues like domestic abuse, the legacy of slavery, refugees, transgender issues. They have a fantastic uh, dementia programme. So what they do is embedded into all that they do. It's not just about programmes around the edges. You see those things in the displays. It's integral to what they are, how they do things. And they do change lives. They have a huge impact. So my third point is about, um, you know, what does this look like in practice? What, what does it mean? And I, I want to share some examples from the work that we've been involved with over a number of years. It's so going to draw on a number of projects uh, that RCMG has been involved with. I want initially to look at three museums which have approached the issue of refugees and asylum seekers. The first here is at Salford Museum. Um, which is in Greater Manchester. It's gritty, it's an urban area of decline, of deprivation. Um, the second example is the light box in Woking. It couldn't be more dif different from Salford. 
It's leafy, it's affluent, it's in the suburb, it's outside London, in Surrey. And the third example is in Glasgow, the Gallery of Modern Art. Um, a, again, a very gritty city. But let me start with, with Salford. Salford was one of the cities de designated as a dispersal area for refugees and asylum seekers under the 1999 Asylum and Immigration Act. It was one of the biggest centres within the country. And like many local authorities, they had a remit to ensure that refugees and asylum seekers were integrated into the host community. So the museum, along with many other people, established programmes. There were, there were massive issues about the integration of refugees and asylum seekers into Salford because Salford is a very deprived area already. And so new people arriving created tensions, uh, the limited education for many people, uh, there's a lot of racism. So there were real problems, real tensions. So the museums got involved in this and they established um, a volunteer programme, so giving refugees and asylum seekers experience in the workplace so that they could begin to develop both life skills and language skills as well. They worked in partnership with uh, a language provider, ESOL, English as a Foreign Language, um, and uh, they worked with a number of other agencies as well. But the refugee experiences led the museum to rethink what they were doing. So they moved from doing their volunteer programme, which they continue to do, but also they decided that they would um, develop, based on the experiences of the refugees, an exhibition as well. The exhibition was called, What Would You Do If? And it, it was a collaboration with artists which drew on the experiences of the refugees and asylum seekers. Nadine, here on the right, was from Afghanistan, who with her family, as she, uh, she'd uh, come from Afghanistan, she was one of the volunteers. She developed many skills in, in the museum, and this developed her language skills especially because most of what she'd learned had been from watching television. She talks about having lived in Salford for five years. I've had some bad times as a refugee, as an asylum seeker, and because I'm Asian. I've seen lots of bad things. And it's only slowly that she revealed that they'd had bricks thrown through the window. She'd had to move several times. And this was after having had the traumatic journey of getting from Afghanistan. Nadine felt very comfortable in the museum. She talked about it being a female-friendly working environment, which was a real advantage for a, a young female Muslim. She practiced her language skills, but it also gave her a chance to come to terms with her traumatic past as well. As I say, the museum were interested in um, using the experiences of those refugees and developed this exhibition called What Would You Do If? The images here for Nadim were a, a um, painful reminder of seeing her home in Kabul devastated by a bomb. She says, the old house was bombed with our clothes inside. Um, the house was just a complete mess. This reminds me of it. The wall, there was a complete, one of the walls had completely gone down. And she remembers seeing the, the burnt clothes hanging uh, in, in the wind. And she just talked about the idea that she never wanted her son to see anything like that. I want to keep him safe. It's a relief to be here. Nadim was involved in what were called Mythbuster workshops, working with young people who could ask her any questions they wanted. She felt empowered to tell her story. She realized that she was the expert. She was the one that had insights. And she reflected on the questions uh, about her past and said, I don't feel bad at talking about it now. The exhibition enabled her to place her experiences in the past and to begin to move on. So the, the, the traumatic process she had um, was something that she was able to hopefully move, move, move from and leave behind. Frames of Refuge was a film that was made uh, in 
by the light box in Woking. As I say, Surrey is a very, very different place from, from Salford. So why did the museum decide to do this? Well, it specifically chose to do work on refugees and asylum seekers because they are not part of the community. They, they're not the sort of people you would see in that area. But they, the local community are fed lots of negative, in, in, uh, negative information in the press, um, particularly in the national press, the particular specific papers that will do that. The museum collaborated with a secondary school as part of a national programme on the impact of war and conflict. And a group of 15 and 16 year old students interviewed refugees and asylum seekers from outside the area to create a film which would dispel some of the myths uh, peddled by the popular press. The project was a mixture of technical skills of filmmaking and interviewing, both very demanding but also of beginning to understand some of those issues. <coughs> they also wanted to dispel some of the myths as well, uh, that huge waves of refugees and asylum seekers were coming to the UK, when actually the st statistics show a, a very different picture. The film um, had great depth of human experience, and I think showed a great sophistication and when we interviewed the head teacher, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that later, we got some real insights into the experiences that the young people had as a result of, of being involved in that. And it always makes me wonder that if every museum in the UK had done something like that, would we have had the same rise of UKIP? Would the Brexit vote have taken place? I don't know. I just like to ponder and wonder. Let's have a look at a short clip of the film. I had no idea about how is it to be a refugee or the process of being an asylum seeker. And a lot of people in the Western countries, they, they have this idea when you come, you, you know about the procedures, we know about the whole system. I haven't had a clue what to do or where to go. So there, one of the refugees says that he had no idea. He had no idea what it was to be a refugee. He was an academic. And her, he described in harrowing detail living in a car because he had nowhere else to live. He talked about the, the, um, uh, when it was frosty outside and how the, the inside of the car was just co covered in, in frost. Um, and just the disbelief of understanding what it was like having a life in limbo. And I think what the film did was to give those young people an insight into very different perspectives. It's something that was shown in the, in the museum uh, and also became available for a much wider public. The third example around this is the um, Scottish city Glasgow. And this is an image of the Gallery of Modern Art. Like Salford, um, Glasgow was uh, a place where there were a number of refugees and asylum seekers, so a huge centre. In thinking of how they would respond to this, Glasgow City Council, as it was then, embarked on a radical rethink of how they could use their contemporary art gallery. The gallery wanted to be relevant and accessible to a broad audience, and it, it had been, but it, it had been accused of dumbing down by uh, working with particular artists and doing uh, and working with particular exhibitions. How could they do cutting edge contemporary art and think about the needs of refugees and asylum seekers? How could they engage with existing communities and new arrivals? The exhibition, um, which was a result of working in collaboration with Amnesty International, was called Sanctuary. It put internationally renowned contemporary artists at centre stage, exploring some of these contentious, complex issues. But integral to the model was an engagement programme, working in a nuanced way with some of the most vulnerable people, exploring issues that had shaped their lives. Most of all, the gallery became a meeting point for conversations a high-profile institution at the heart of the city, focusing on refugees and asylum seekers. 
it was symbolic that it was central to the city and it was really significant that that was part of the process. The title, Sanctuary, was also significant, setting the tone. These three examples, I hope, begin to show some of the significance of the context and the rationale of why people do things. Why is this emerging and what happens as a result? The need to develop strategic partnerships to ensure that work happens effectively in an, in, in an appropriate way. The sustaining of relationships, the safe working practices, the ongoing commitment, and the value of, public, of, of museums and galleries as public trusted in, uh, institutions. But for Glasgow, this was the beginning rather than the end. Um, for Goma, it, this experience became something that they became very committed to through their contemporary art and human rights programme. So a hugely significant piece of work. It resulted in a huge biannual programme of contemporary art. Um, and you can see here the four areas. These are examples of some of the areas they've worked in. Really challenging areas. Rule of thumb was about violence against women. There are very high rates of violence against women within Glasgow, and they're related in many ways to the, to the next one called Blind Faith, which was around sectarianism. Blind Faith explored this, the divide between Catholic and Protestants, which mirrors communities in Northern Ireland. It's embedded in the fabric of the city, the football teams, Celtic and Rangers, places of worship, schools, it's absolutely about divided communities. And this was an attempt to address some of those issues and to really begin to look at them and to reflect as a city on what that really meant. Shout, which was about LGBTI issues, is perhaps more familiar to me because we, underdid, uh, we undertook an in-depth evaluation of visitors' responses to this um, and community participants. It had a profound impact on community participants, which um, we'll talk a little bit more about later, um, but particularly in relation to the trans community who often have to compartmentalise their lives um, one young guy, a, a young um, a guy who, who was coming out, talked about as a teenager, he said, I thought I was weird. I thought I was the only one going through this. But the film shows that lots of people are in the same situation. They can help you move forward and give you confidence. And the reality was that show actually caused an enormous controversy. Uh, one of the national papers the Daily Mail uh, had a sustained barrage of abuse against the, the gallery. And it was really centered around a couple of Mablethorpe uh, photographs, which ironically had been on show in the Edinburgh Festival many years before, with absolutely no comment about them at all. But there was an absolute tirade of abuse as a result, uh, a result of this, whipping up social media, uh, getting support that way. So the exhibition ended up becoming hugely controversial. Uh, at one stage, there were people demonstrating outside the offices of the director in the pavement. It went on for weeks and weeks and weeks. So there was a huge amount of uh, high profile abuse about it. But in the piece of work that we did, we found that 71% of visitors expressed their support for the exhibition. 29% either expressed an objection to the exhibition or the theme. But what was interesting was that the front of house staff said that they had seen many people coming into the building, getting batches of response cards, filling them in, not even going and seeing the exhibition. So I think we have to be cautious sometimes about the elements of, of, um, uh, of controversy that are, uh, result in some of the work, and also be a bit more uh, thick-skinned about it as well, and be clear about why we're doing things. I want to move on now to look at the final example, and this is a project that we're involved in, or have been involved in for many years, so ex focusing specifically around disability. Um, and as a contemporary issue, people may think, well, why is disability a particularly significant contemporary issue? We know we have integrated access, we know we have legal obligations to make places accessible, but actually, 
we have done very little to understand how, how discriminated against disabled people are in every aspect of their life. So it's not just about access, but it's about how deep-rooted our inability and our fear of disability is. So whilst society's come a long way, we're sti there's still a huge amount of negativity and sadly still a huge amount of hate crimes exist against disabled people. The work that we've been involved in emerged originally from work around access, but very quickly uh, there was a, a question which was raised by the group we were working with, a disability consultative group, and the question they asked was, when I have access, what will I see? Where will my life be? Where are my life experiences in the collections? And if you look at the back of this picture, this, uh, this image, you can see the ban on sign language. And in the, at the Milan conference in 1880, sign language was banned, ironically, by Alexander Graham Bell and many associates. So whilst, give in, whilst uh, confidently giving us lots of skills to be able to communicate by the telephone, he was limiting the deaf community, including his own wife, who was profoundly deaf as well. Um, and by limiting the use of, of, of sign language, the deaf community, for really the next hundred years, had their capacity to communicate limited in a whole host of ways. And the image here shows uh, a, 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 theater, a, a dance piece by a group called Deaf Men Dancing which drew on lots of material from, from collections, museum collections, to reinterpret that and to think about uh, the kind of questions it tells us about why there's so much negativity around disability today, when actually many deaf people simply describe themselves as being a linguistic minority. What this led us to was to a series of projects which explored the representation of disabled people, beginning initially, as you can see from some of these images here, by just finding out what there was in museums. Was there any material? And actually what we found were huge riches from across the board, from sculptures by Mark Quinn, to uh, magic lantern slides of drunken sailors, to uh, painting by William Holman Hunt, pre-Raphaelite painter, and then then you can see lots of um, prosthetics as well. So a huge amount of material was available. But one of the things that we did in this project was also um, to find out about curators experiences and what we found most of all was a fear of doing things, a, a fear of getting things wrong and I think there are often professional fears of being unsure about how to do things and needing to do that in a more supported way. One of the things that we did as a result of this was to develop a project called Rethinking Disability Representation, where we worked to try to interrogate these collections in new ways and support museums to do that through a model called a trading zones model, which some of you may be familiar with, but it's the idea of bringing people together from lots of different perspectives, but not privileging any one voice. And this is especially important where you have people who are working on a professional basis and those people who have a lived experience of something. So hugely important. This was new territory. It was often challenging. It was often problematic. Some of the material was very difficult, but the most difficult material was in medical museum collections. And especially because, as you can see here, they include uh, material, uh, human bits of humans in jars and complete skeletons as well. This is the Royal College of Surgeons in London. And the other problem with, with those collections is they're completely framed by a medical view of disability as well, which absolutely sees there being a problem and a need for cure. So we were very concerned to use a much more social model of disability and we worked with the performer uh, Matt Fraser, who you may have come across, he's quite an eclectic guy, a drummer, um, uh, an actor, uh, all-round uh, performer, I think it's fair to say. 
Uh, he's working in the States at the moment, but a very uh, in interesting person to work with. And what's, what we did with him was to work with three medical museum collections to try to reassess those in a different way, moving away from that very medicalised view of disability to be able to think about them in a much more holistic way from the perspective of a disabled person, but using the skills and experience of curators and Matt developed something, a performance, which was, uh, it was quite a hybrid, I think it's fair to say. It was part lecture, part pastiche, part rap, and most of all, a critique of a medicalised understanding of disability. The Cabinet of Curiosities, how disability was kept out of the box, challenged people, um, sometimes in very crushing ways because of the medicalised way of thinking of it. But I want to show you a very short clip of um, uh, Terry Wiles, who uh, Matt interviewed as part of this project. And it shows you, uh, Terry's mother took the thalidomide drug. Uh, and he, as a result of this, like many people who had thalidomide, he was given a number of different attempts by the medical profession to normalize him. And you'll see a contraption that was made for him that gave him gas-powered arms and legs. When you see the film, think about it in relation to what his adoptive father did, which was to make a very early um, wheel electric wheelchair for him, giving him mobility. The essence of his problem was that society wanted to normalise him. Uh, but actually, <laughs> the reality was his father gave him mobility, and I think that's the difference. We're going to see a little clip of the film now. While we're um, just waiting to get that up, I'll just tell you a little bit about the, um, the following project, which is um, called Exceptionally Extraordinary and Really Bodies and Minds in the Medical Museum. So we're currently working on this project, and what we've been trying to do with that is to explore the issues um, which have uh, the medical view of disability has been very focused around fixing and curing and thinking of that deficit model of problematic bodies. We've worked with four artists, a stand-up comedian, Francesca Martinez. Let's leave it. Okay, so um, this project uh, around medical museums, as I say, we're working with four artists. Um, here you can see on the right Francesca Martinez, who's a stand-up comedian. And here she is at the Royal College of Surgeons, and she's having a conversation with William Osler, who coined the phrase cerebral palsy. Now, Francesca prefers to call herself wobbly. Okay, that's her preferred choice. She thinks that having cerebral palsy isn't very sexy. So she has a conversation with William Osler, who coined the phrase, a hilarious sort of division between the early 20th century and, and the 21st century. So they talk about, um, you know, it's not very sexy if you're on Tinder, and uh, if, if, if you're saying I've, I'm brain damaged, so I would send myself, if, uh, if I got myself from Amazon, I'd send myself back, would I? Um, but the reality of it is, it's about really critiquing those collections and thinking about them in new ways. We also worked with Mark Smith on the left here, who's a choreographer, um, and he was really fascinating in terms of, of engaging with those issues around deaf culture. This is what we set out to achieve, this idea of having a big question which would frame our work. So we, we realised that since humans first appeared on Earth, no two have been the same, yet somewhere along the way, certain bodies and minds have been more highly valued and some have been viewed as problematic, as deviant, and really deficient, and a, a requiring adjustment towards the perceived norm. We're currently working across these projects, looking at collections, investigating them, using a mixture of people, um, so disability activists, medical historians, curators, and investigating those collections in new ways, and coming up with new pieces, like this Hold the Hearst by Julie McNamara, who's in the show there, which looks specifically at learning disability and mental health, and, and looks at the experiences of Mad Mary, who was incarcerated um, because she'd lost a child. 
all the images that are used in, in, in the play came from, from various parts of museum collections and incredibly powerful. The young guy, Eden, who, who's playing one of the characters there, it was his, his first professional role. And as a disabled person, it, he was incredibly powerful. As I say, it also resulted in uh, a film um, and this uh, beautiful piece of dance as well, which looked at, at sign language and the impact of, of, of that being banned and the experiences of having to learn an oral way of communicating, which was of absolutely no use because people couldn't hear. So what are the ethics of working in this way? What are the challenges of working around these issues? Well, these are incredibly sensitive themes. So how we address them, how we need to work with vulnerable people, how we need to think in a careful way to avoid harm, how we need to think about how people are represented is absolutely critical to the work. Um, and it's hugely important that we take responsibility thought uh, that we have effective res uh, relationships, that we respect people, that we navigate through the challenging issues um, to be able to do this. And one of the things that we're really interested in, and particularly my colleague Janet Marstein, is around uh, the idea of ethics as a process, as a set of ideas, not a set, set of standards to be met, but something that helps us navigate through challenging issues. So some of the things we might think about are the appropriate methods of avoiding harm, of being able to get everybody's views and experiences. So we do need to capture impact and we need to ca capture the diversity of voices. And here you can see the way in which uh, for some projects we're able to do that through a variety of different methods, both qualitative and quantitative, but simple methods like response cards, giving us some really in-depth understanding through the most limited number of words, as you can see here from one disabled person, at last I'm here in the center. Simple techniques like this. <coughs> and my favorite of all, these, this is based around something that was found in a museum, uh, found at home uh, of somebody that had died, cotton reels that had five pound notes rolled up inside them. And it's a lovely way of asking people to respond. But what we know is from those people that are important, like this head teacher, that these, these kinds of programs have a profound impact on, on those people who've participated. And that can be both the young people, but also uh, the other participants as well. We can use a range of different methodologies, like the generic learning outcomes here, which can help to categorize these. But most of all, let's just think through that framework for action. That framework has to be about values. It has to be about values that are shared across an organization. It's about proactive work. It's about being dynamic. It's about having diversity and, and really valuing that diversity. It's about using um, models like trading zones. It's around having questions. It's about understanding this work is pro problematic but we have to be ethical. But most of all, it's about having courage and it's about actually taking action. Thank you.